Well, hello, everybody. I'm John Barnwell, and I'm here in the greater metropolitan area of the city of Detroit. And I'm here with my good friend, the president of the American Shakespeare Theater, an Emmy Award winning videographer and a lifetime anthroposophist slash student of Rudolf Steiner. And as everybody might know, or if you don't, I've also been a lifetime student. I first found out about Rudolf Steiner in, in the eighth grade in gym class. <laughs> and when I heard his name, I felt a, a glow from my heart. I didn't necessarily understand it, but it, you know, things become clear in retrospection many times. How you doing there, Joe? Are you ready for part six of Rudolf Steiner on the Grail Legend? I am, but you just kicked off a memory. I remember when my mom had discovered him in uh, Rudolf Steiner in 1972, and not long after, she had a picture framed of him and put in our living room on the wall. There was no other family members there, so people would come in the house, strangers or you know, new friends, and who's that? Oh, that's my uncle, because <laughs> she never really shared this with anybody in the world, right? Who does? And uh, so forever, I'm like, Mom, you're lying. <laughs> Tell them who it is. <laughs> you know? And it was an older picture from the 19, I don't know, 18, 1920. But uh, just kind of funny, those early memories of who is this guy? And what's this all about? I don't know. You know, a lot of people that I talk to put, as I talk about rail language, they, they fall asleep or they can't make it to one page. I, as soon as I read it, I was like 16. I think it was 72. I was like, whoa. This guy, you know, makes sense. And I remember saying, boy, he's concentrating on one issue. And I had nowhere else to connect whatever I was reading. Um, so I just said, let me just gather this and look at it objectively. And I had the patience, which most people didn't, to get to the next step with him. And then and just to the end of the book. And then it puts you like, I don't know, it shoots you into outer space in a, in a rocket and you're floating out there. Well, you know, I mean, you're a trained engineer, right? Yeah. Yeah, and I could have gone in that direction when I was young. They tested all of us, and and I scored really, really high in, in those categories, but I was more interested in music. Yeah. But uh, Well, I was yeah. too. You had that dichotomy. Well, but see, the thing is, is people that go into engineering uh, – you know, like R Rudolf Steiner essentially was trained in engineering. You know, he went to the the Technologie. He said, had he gone to the Realschule, the you know more liberal arts school, he he would have possibly become a Cistercian monk, so he could just spend his life studying. You know, but uh, throughout the history, I've mentioned this before, but it's timely to mention it now. As I said. Many of the deeper students that I've known of the cosmology aspect, which is that tradition that really streams from uh, the uh, second post-Atlantean period, that stream of Zarathustra. And uh, it has to do with the uh, understanding that there's people that they uh, wonder how things work. And, and that's the kind of person that tends to become an engineer. And, I, you know, I knew Bing Escudero. He was the head of the Theosophical Society. He was trained as an engineer. And, uh, uh, numerous other individuals that I knew that had that kind of a background. They want to understand the layout of the cosmology. But as of late, I've been looking at the uh, material that... that is let me get my notes here. I have some notes stuck stuck away. The Kushnum, which is the esoteric Zarathustrian tradition, and according to their writings, that are very very obscure. So so obscure, I've never heard any anthroposophist mention it other than myself. But uh, according to, to the esoteric Zarathustrians. Uh, the birth date of the original Zarathustra was 7,551 BC. The original. So we're talking about Stone Age. 
and they also corroborate the idea that this material world is the fourth in the series of uh, three preceding worlds. Just like it's laid out by Rudolf Steiner and the Hopi Indians, and you can go all over the world and you'll, you'll be able to find if you know what you're looking for. And so there's a way of looking at the world that includes that dynamic. Right. And that's part and parcel about what we've been discussing here because much of what we see today as scientism, other people with engineering fascination, but refusing to go beyond that there's anything that doesn't have a material cause. And that's kind of the, the rub and that's the dilemma. And that's the type of thinking that brings you into crisis uh, situations because it's based on fear. Yeah, and, and the other thing is for me, I was musician, very young, loved it, but also had the, my father was a contractor, carpenter, all the trades. And, and I think the world goes through this, that part of you that knows art and you feel artist, and then you're forced to put it down to do work and order. And so, but for me, I would come home after work or school with all the structure. And I just want to, like we all did, get the guitar, play, loosen up, let the feeling come in. And, um, and it's the struggling artist, the starving artist compelled to not just be satisfied because how can you integrate the engineering of medicine, the engineering of technology, uh, the engineering, I'll call it, of politics and policy making, all law. And there's so much, it's very Debbie Downer. <laughs> it's heavy, especially when you're young. So um, that artful part that lifts you up, the comedy, the play, the acting, uh, sculpting, painting, everything that gets a young person fluid. I never lost that. I'm, I'm sure you didn't either. Uh, so it's that tug of war between the structure and then the, the breathing uh, and living that's hard for the materialist today to actually put together. Well, and that ties in with Rudolf Steiner's indications that uh, as far as wholesome ways to approach uh, developing one's relation with the realms of soul and spirit is art, music, and history, <laughs> which is kind of, you know, you say that to people and they, their eyes kind of glaze over because what what do those things all share in common? You know? Time. And, and uh, it's that relationship to the imaginative world that's, that's so significant when you look at like for example, the musical work of Mozart or Beethoven or Chopin. I mean, where does it come from? And, and you can hear that I've heard on numerous occasions people in classical music talking about how the music, uh, so to speak, was something that was visited upon them and that they were like secretaries notating the music that they were receiving. And when you bring in the history element, that's so important because in the uh, first post-Atlantean period, that's the old Indian period, when this is referring to that birth date of Zarathustra, 7,551 BC. So, you know, 10, 15,000 BC, Atlantis sinks, and the first post-Atlantean period begins with the old Indian period as described by Rudolf Steiner. And he makes the point that, that they don't really have a, a developed desire to uh, bring about a strong relationship to the material world. You know, they were still hearkening back to the supersensible realms. And it, that it was Zarathustra that brought in that impulse that led to agriculture and to try and take and make the world better and the concept of the importance of, of cycles of time and, uh, you know, with the Zen and, and the ancient uh, Iranian deity, the, the prehistoric Zarathustrian deity, Zervan. And Zervan means time. And so there's that whole idea that links into where Rudolf Steiner says that one of the gifts that 
that Jesus Christ gave us through the mystery of Golgotha with the ascension and the resurrection is he gave us back time. And we come to an understanding that we are in a developing process that unfolds within the realm of time. Yeah, and that's, I'm glad you just brought that in because I was trying to get a hold of you yesterday while I was in Manhattan and uh, what a different world that place is. Um, and I remember uh, reading uh, an excerpt from some post on social media about the, uh, the four elements that make up the human form that are soul and spirit incarnate and inhabit We'll call it inhabit, and then how when we die, which was so important, when we cross over, the angelic realms begin to bring together f forces that create a body for us to live in. Um, and so thinking about it, and that's just a simple statement, it's much, much more than that. But but the fact that where am I going when this when time supposedly ends, when the three-dimensional world or what happens to time when I cross over? Where is time? Uh, and Rudolf Steiner's very clear to talk about Kama Loka and these different periods, how they're not measured uh, pro exactly the way we are here on Earth. It's a duration, a span. But And then you hear about the old uh, religions, uh, eternity in hell, fire and brimstone. Eternity? Well, how long is that? Forever? I mean, wh what's forever when there's no time? So this time organism is really the, the crux of everything it really is and i don't think science has even spent enough time approaching it outside of um, the three-dimensional speed of light well they uh they tend to to uh calibrate their observations and then extrapolate on that and they're assuming uh, they're operating on the, the assumption, the radical assumption, you know, and Rudolf Steiner, the great example that Rudolf Steiner gives, he says, it's like trying to calculate uh, by your, your uh, studies uh, what an infant's stomach looked like hundreds of years ago when the infant didn't exist. You know, he's, he, is making the point that they assume that the way the equilibrium of material forces is something that's constant. And according to uh, the esoteric tradition, it's not. That it goes through a metamorphosis. And that if you want to understand, well, what is this materium? What is this material substance? It's spirit but at a different point in time. So it's a manifestation of, of spirit. And that's a challenging concept. Yeah, and that's that thing we were talking about, the engineering versus the art. Because think about what Jesus says, only the Father will know when. Well, when is when? Is it when aware, a place? Think about when, outside the realm of matter. And so concentrated matter, darkness, materiality, really we're dealing with existential stuff so when we hear the big bang when we hear the origin there's actually no way that science could ever find that because it well, precedes, precedes time <laughs> well they want to they want to try and and dominate the search for the miraculous as as ospensky called it you know the search, search for the miraculous so instead of having all these things that that can't be explained by material formula. Uh, that what they do is they bring it all the way back and they just have one, they have a big bang. You know, it's like, <laughs> they reduce it down to just one big miraculous event, the big bang. <laughs> and, and, uh, yeah, well, and this leads it's us hilarious. to something practical that I'm sure you've experienced in your years and i have and others listening and watching this is so important the, the miraculousness of solving a problem or a dilemma you have if you meditate on it and sit down pray on it if you have a lot of need and necessity going on in your emotions um and urgency how 
solutions can come. And, and, and if people in business know this, I mean, everybody knows this who runs anything practical, the magic of the day or the, the business day at a restaurant or a bar or whatever, it's, it's all of a sudden things can change and they happen all the time. Time is shifting in its duration and its presence all day long in our practical lives. And we notice it. We all notice it. You'll be doing, I'll be doing a roof job years ago with my crew. All of a sudden, 11 o'clock to one o'clock, we are putting more shingles on and we're not even trying to do it. It's a not just rhythm. Things are happening. Time is changing. And we all notice it. We take a break. Let's not take a break because we may not get this rhythm again. This is wild. And so everybody knows this, but they don't know how to I say or quantify or better yet, explain and comprehend time organism within our daily life. Go, John. I know I hit. I know hit. No, a that's a good one because uh, it reminds me of playing music. You know, I'd be up there playing, and and I wouldn't even be watching what I'm doing up there, jamming with you know guys from uh, town here. You know, play with Kid Rock or uh, Mitch Ryder, Detroit Wheels people, and all that. And I'd be up there playing, and all of a sudden. I'd rip off a series of licks that were great that I didn't even know. And, and it's like I, I, I'm in my mind trying to make sure that I remember how to do that. Right. Because I don't know where it came from. <laughs> so that supervised consciousness, that's almost like, and you should know this if you were in electronics and you did an alarm system in a, a building or a home, there's a line that they put in the line in case the line gets snipped and you won't know which one it is. And that's just a line that's called the supervised line. So if the line is cut, that triggers something that says, to the police or whatever, the line's been cut, you know? And that's what we have in our consciousness. We have a supervised conscious, a higher conscious is above, above the one we're talking with. We're doing it right now. I have a thing I want to tell John later and it's operating up here in my mind. And I got to make sure I don't forget to tell him about this little thought while we're having a conversation. People doing this all day long, but it's it's something that is, is gets missed in, I'll just call it education. It gets missed in regulation, places where it needs to be, law, regulations, procedures, uh, teaching children. Uh, it's in the doing that the magic happens, not in the just teaching or showing. It's it, And we all do this all day long. Everybody's doing 99% of it, and they don't know that it's not something that can be something that can, that's not something that can be mass produced. It's a living element. It's a human element. And it has to do with the hierarchies and higher beings coming in all the time. And people should know, and they do probably wonder, well, what the heck? How did I know that? How did this little thing, a million little things that occurred it should never have happened. It wasn't just my subconscious mind that is nowhere in my body. <laughs> my subconscious mind is nowhere. You tell me where it is. It doesn't exist in science. <laughs> so how does all this work? And But everybody knows this. I think I feel always positive that we are more and more with our left brain realizing and tracking with our phones. Wait a second. A lot of miracles just happened in my life today, and I don't know how. And it, and it was not. This is just a tool. But uh, And I just think we're, we're going to get breakthrough upon breakthrough coming soon because the overload of information, technology, regulation is going to get people even more pushing back and wanting to call forth that common sense, intuitive, artistic doing. Yeah, well, I mean, I, it's not hard to find examples, you know, like, for example, uh, Dmitry Mendeleev in 1869, he formulated the periodic table of elements and attributed it to uh, the way he saw it in a dream. Right. <laughs> okay, so l let's get a little bit realistic here. Uh, Rudolf Steiner in, in the book, I didn't bring, oh, here it is. Yes, in the first lecture in this wonderful book, uh, Initiation, Science, and Development of the Human Mind. And that's in the uh, Collected Works, Volume 228. And in the first lecture, he talks about how uh, you can go, seeking, uh, you know, with having that wonder, taking into the world of sleep and from the, the spirits of Jupiter, receive the wisdom that the, that wisdom element is coming from that, and that 
relates to the, the third eye, the brow chakra. The crown is Saturn. Sat, but he says the, the Saturn beings can give you the past of the cosmos, the cosmic memory aspect of it. But to understand the working of the wisdom, then you have that. Well, today's Thursday. Today is the day of Jupiter. So I guess that's auspicious that we're discussing this. But there's that there's a realm of beings beyond the periodic table, so to speak that are not composed of the substance of the periodic table, that the periodic table is a creation of these higher supersensible beings ultimately. And our description of them, and you can have the interesting descriptions of it by uh, Walter Russell, who conceived of it, the, he took the periodic table and put it in a spiral as a result of an experience of enlightenment that he had as a young man. When he came out of it, he knew engineering, sculpture, uh, fine art painting, and many other things that he'd never studied. And he was an architect for important buildings in New York City and the Swannanoa down in, in uh, Kentucky uh, was this wonderful place that he built, this big, huge mansion for him and his wife. and. And with all these sculptures representing ideals, so that you see these people when you when you look deep enough, it's a very frequent case that that they're receiving from uh, super sensible realms, so to speak, uh, inspirations that guide them uh, toward what they're trying to achieve. And so, like the the old saying, "Well, just sleep on it," <laughs> you know, it's like wonder, wonder. Yeah, wonder. It's, it's that wonder, and which is interesting because when you look at that in relationship to what Rudolf Steiner says, because he says that the mystery of Golgotha redeemed the etheric and physical organizations for all mankind, as I said before, criminals included. You know, so we didn't get to totally screw up Earth evolution in terms of the etheric and physical, but that. During the uh, archangelic period of the Archangel Gabriel before November of 1879, there was a, a development within the convolutions of the brain that made it a perfect receptacle to be able to develop that Jupiter center through uh, the Michaelic period. But that was up to individuals to take up the task. It wasn't going to be done for them. And there's a certain period of time in which you can work on this. And once that time runs out, if you haven't done it, well, you you don't move on to the next episode in the same way. And so that's where we are now. And that's kind Listen. of why I, I, I'm, I've been so insistent of talking about these things day after day after day. Well, it, it, it's also because the development, the, I shouldn't say development, I'll call it the evolution of the human form, the human species. What science knows, the evolution of the spiritual aspect of ourselves, if these things are not completely done over time, what will happen to the human form? What will happen to the um, consciousness development? What happens if we fall prey? And, and you're seeing technology looking to be the catcher. If this is a baseball game, be the catcher. We'll catch and then we'll make something up uh, where they can fall into. But we're missing that process. M much of mankind is missing it directly the way we do it, but they're not missing it according to what the things I said earlier, how I felt positive about these things that mankind is going through. It's uh, unorthodox. It's happening naturally to human beings and there's nothing wrong with naturally uh as long as it's happening and it doesn't get crushed underfoot by technology education uh fake education uh and structure but as we develop uh for the next archangel what is michael bringing now that is necessary for the next archangel which will become an archai of uh, Raphael? um a dude that's going to bring some bad stuff. I'll let John take off on that one with disease and plagues and human 
walking dead that's going to happen in the world if something doesn't occur through the Michael time. Yes, and uh, it's it's to a large extent, Rudolf Steiner describes as, as these basically arbitrary creations of uh, the human intellect. And so it, it becomes a question of uh, being able to, to get back to the drawing board, so to speak. There's four gospels, okay? And there's, so there's four fundamental uh, impulses that Christ tried to, to bring to mankind. And then, of course, Paul, he's the fifth one. But what he did was he served as a bridge to take Christianity out of just the, the milieu of the Jewish people, to take it to the, the Greeks and Romans and, and all the subsequent developments after that. And also with... Uh, uh, St. John on the Isle of Patmos, so that you have that stream, and then you have the stream of Mark going down to Egypt, and Mark being uh, kind of an understudy of Luke, but uh, tying into the, the connecting with the priest from the Serapium in Alexandria, Ormus, and so that you have that Egyptian mystery stream coming up in, into the Rosicrucian stream through that Ormus figure that is mentioned in some of the lodges as being a founding moment. And which is interesting because you have that and then you have St. Paul's esoteric school in Athens with Dionysius the Areopagite uh, founding that. And the, of course, the developed presentation of those teachings was the writings of Dionysius the Areopagite that came out in the sixth century that gave you the angels, archangels, archai on up all the way through the nine hierarchy. So that this is a, a stream that has been like pretty much unnoticed by your standard types of biblical scholarship, just as the, the, uh, stream that I was mentioned earlier uh, regarding the esoteric Zarathustra stream and that you have that uh, deeper impulse that that is able to uh, come out of that Kushnum tradition or the school of Dionysius or the school uh, in which uh, in a later incarnation Zarathustra incarnated during the time of uh, the late prophets, and it was he was a teacher of Pythagoras and also a teacher of Cyrus. In fact, it's said that he was a cousin of some sort to uh, King Cyrus, who allowed the Jews to return to Jerusalem and refound the temple. So that you have these monumental events that have been done by these great beings that are developed in advance of mankind to be able to give us something, to be able to fortify us, to come into a relationship with all of these really miraculous understandings that that transform you. I mean, it changes the quality of your sleep if you can have a, a sacred relationship to your sleep and realize that if I can bring myself into focus during the day and dedicate myself to the Christ, you know, the grail stream, that even if you're just doing it in your imagination and aspiration, uh, you'll bear fruit while you sleep. I, and, and Rudolf Steiner speaks about this. I, I've said it so many times that it, it, it's simple, but it's not. In his philosophy of freedom, which he renames the philosophy of spiritual activity, he speaks about spiritual activity, which you just mentioned. Um, imagine, um, seek uh, emotionally. Emotion is so important to not leave emotion out of it. When you're seeking and you're praying and you're asking uh, to open your heart um, 
which we do know from our religions, our heart should be open, but not always is it open. But in that seeking, it's in that activity. It's not whether we were clear or we understood everything completely in its true form. It's that we were seeking. We we prompt our be our almost like the ignition of a car. You get in. It's a park. You turn, pump the gap, and the car starts. Everything is set to seek and to open. Uh, so, which allows the spiritual world, we're basically turning our being into a question mark. And if you think about that, how the question mark is, it's like the skull and a spinal cord with a little dot underneath. <laughs> think about that, the, the form, a form of the skull and the spinal cord. And we turn our being into a question mark, which opens up again, knock and it will be open, seek and you will find. And it's, there's so much in that. In our daily lives, I always like to bring everything back to practical applications today. Um, the history of all these things will show us, but how do people apply it today without some kind of self-help guru? What is it that you know? Trust yourself, trust your feelings, trust what you know. And as I just think more and more of humanity at every level, uh, if people are, are at different levels, uh, of consciousness across the planet, we are all experiencing, Michael, we're all experiencing this um, cosmopolitan. It really is. Uh, and it's a global thing. In, in, in the globalist, and this is what we have a lot of problems with globalism, that it, it is a time of global. It is a time of cosmopolitan, Michael. It's not the time of cosmopolitan global turning this into a one world order. That's not the same thing. That's been hijacked by materialists and the establishment. And that's what they do because they know it is the time of Michael for all mankind to share in all of this. It's free, it's open, and it's supposed to be global. Um, and, and we see a lot of the uh, right think tanks talking about, you know, global order and one world order. We can't fear that we have to understand what's being gamed. Almost the same thing we're seeing with the sixth epic coming, what's happening in Ukraine and Russia. We're seeing something that's going to be coming and something looks to tear it down, to destroy it, to ruin it, to mess up the birth of it in the sixth epic by destroying the fifth, uh, the land, the people, war, annihilation, nuclear, something because something good and holy through the Christ is occurring in Russia and Ukraine in the next epic so don't don't throw the baby out with the bathwater recognize that if it looks like it's dark there's a positive side to it yes and you have to understand that in these cycles of time that the seeds are planted before the period comes so for example this this uh, Christum, uh indication of the birth date of zarathustra as he began as under that impulse, uh, 7,551 BC. So the age of cancer, uh, that began in, in uh, 7227 BC, okay? So we're talking about, this would have been the incarnation when he was at the Sun Mystery Center with Manu, Scythianos, and other individuals, and there were be leading out migrations from Atlantis. There's the Northern stream through uh, Europe. And then there's the Southern stream that came across North Africa. And so, which is very interesting. This is in reference to the 2,160 year cycles of the ages of which we're in the fifth post-Atlantean period. So it began in 1413, 1414. So if you count it back 2,160 year cycles, that brings you back to 7227 BC with the age of cancer, right? So that's that that Noah time. That's the you know sinking of Atlantis, Manu leading across with the seven Rishis and that whole development of Vedic culture. culture. And, and but yet you have that planting of the seed of the next following period, which would be in uh, 50, 67 BC. Okay, so that's the beginning of the Persian period where Zarathustra becomes a leading individual. And if you go to the uh, the Desatir and the and the Dabistan, a couple of obscure books, I'm quite confident that 
hardly anybody who's going to be watching that will know what I'm referring to. But in, in the Desatira, it talks about the seven incarnations of Zarathustra. So it, it behooves one to be able to have a wholesome relationship to the cycles of time. And that was the whole impulse that Zarathustra brought. So he's, he's said to be responsible for developing the fruit trees from crossbreeding and the grains. Uh, so you have this incredible impulse coming out of Iran at that time and leading up to uh, the mysteries that are described in the Gospel of Matthew is just, uh, just it's just wonderful uh, area of study. And I just try to plant a few seeds. Maybe somebody might find interest and go look it up. If not now in a hundred years, John, <laughs> if this if this lasts and YouTube doesn't crash in a few years <laughs> or the internet, but yeah, you're, you're correct. And, and, and this is something also to look at because people get caught up with the, the darker forces and the opposition, I'll call it. Um, just imagine that we have a crop of corn and there's going to be a hurricane or, uh, or thunder and lightning and tornadoes and tear up the field. Uh, so we, we have activity that's seeking as opposition, as opposing forces to destroy. And people may wonder, well, what does that mean for that time period? And uh, Rudolf Steiner does speak about karma and how in eventually future times and future worlds that compensation will be made. Everything gets fit back in, but it is frustrating. It's like somebody, you know, flips over the monopoly table in the middle of the game. And we have to remember who owned what houses and how many hotels and how much cash did each person have in the bank. Um, it is very frustrating for, um, for the higher beings and for angels and elemental everything. This is a, this is like just like you'd have a problem in your town and there's flooding and roads are out and schools are canceled. It's that kind of thing. It's messed up. We see that with COVID for two years. Come talk about messing up karma or the destiny of people. Uh, how much was for how much dark, darker seeds were planted that then become, well, COVID has caused this, but then now we have to reintegrate. And this is a problem for, uh, for the establishment more than I believe it is for the higher higher beings because we're art, more artistic and living and caring and you can make compensation for destiny and changes where the system itself can only print money and hand it out <laughs> and hope something gets done somewhere. We have that unique power and ability as human beings with connected to the spiritual world to make those miracles happen before the establishment looks to plug back in its policies and its wars and its its complete disorder called order. Yeah, the, the serving uh, anti-social agenda. And what's interesting, another thing in, in Pishtum is they, they're uh, equating Araman with Satan, which is right on, right on spot on. And, and that's from uh, writings that surfaced, you know, like in the 1800s. So it's uh, interesting. It it's uh, it totally uh, supports the indications that were given by Rudolf Steiner, and also uh, the indications given by Madame Blavatsky. And you see that the the connection, uh, the wonderful work that was done by David Regal and his wife on the the secret books, Blavatsky's secret books is one of the secret document reference series. And he went to Asia and attempted to find the source waters of the so-called stanzas of Dijon on which the secret doctrine is based, on which the cosmology of the uh, septenary chain of Manvantaras and, and all of that came from and tracing it back to uh, Kala Chakra uh, tradition and and the uh, esoteric Buddhist, and that's not the religion Buddhism per se, but the the deeper inner uh, universal Buddhism. That's what one D. Say if you 
There's a difference between 1D and 2Ds. But yeah, it ties into the Pali canon of Buddha and all of that. But so you have this, this harmony between all genuine traditions. And you have this disharmony with scientism, which is something that just kind of showed up not very long ago. And it doesn't have uh, sufficient data sets to be able to come to uh, the harmonious resolution thus far. Because Rita Steiner does talk about uh, future developments in technology where uh, you could only operate certain machinery if you had the sufficient moral forces. Mm -hmm. And so you see that there's, there's future episodes that can, can evolve out of this current dilemma that we're in. We just have to be part of the team that's putting our aspiration and heart forces towards a wholesome uh, transition. Right. And, and for people that are at any level of looking behind these secrets of existence, um, they may wonder, well, when did this all come about? How come mankind wasn't led before to know these things? And why is this information out there? And what are you guys into? And how do you know this? What, what is it based on? Where, where do you begin? Uh, these secrets and the mysteries are always in different forms, but they always existed. But mankind, since... Kali Yuga and it is really uh, in 1899 able to pick it up. We're, we're developed enough, everyone on the planet here, to develop enough, and it will not be harmful to to know this information, to seek this information. There's been a, a change in policy. Let's just call it that. Since 1899, if this was the federal government. There's new rules and these laws or immigration, whatever. It's the whole thing has been changed. And we've seen that in our daily life. And all of a sudden, cannabis is legal and you can sell it now. Wow. For a million years, you couldn't do that. That was illegal. You go to you know prison. Massachusetts right now is seeking to um, legalize prostitution. Whoa. Uh, online gambling and gaming is legal. Whoa. It's like, so again, it's these things that were taboo and bad for you. Not that these things aren't bad for you, but, but they are now we're moving through a spiritual transformation. Well, if you get into uh, looking at that and like going to scripture with Sodom and Gomorrah, right? And I mean, the storyline basically, according to the uh, Kabbalah and the rabbis, that they say that the problem with Sodom and Gomorrah wasn't that people sin, that, that people people sin, they do sin, but they it's because they codified their sins into law that that uh, Sodom and Gomorrah had to go down. And so it's like we're look, what we're looking at right now with the codification of things that were illegal, criminal, I mean, yeah. yeah, criminal. I mean, just. Uh, absurd uh, in California and other places. And uh, it, it I, I don't want to be negative or anything, but it kind of uh, harkens back to some of the predictions of Edgar Casey regarding California. Yeah, yeah he, he handles that pretty wild. Um, but the other thing is what I'm trying to get at here is in a nice conversation is that the spiritual world evolves. Not every spiritual being stays in its station, there's an evolution and there's an evolution that occurs in their relationship with us. And it is going through major transformations. So to think that this is a stagnant, fixed system, like the materialists think the sun has always existed or however, and it all works like that. Uh, and it didn't, and it wasn't, but they believe that's what they see. And that's what was forever. So to believe that our religions, which are all, I don't want to say failing, but they're becoming outdated in our time. And they don't have the power that they had at one point. But there is an evolutionary change. And it's scary because people don't even know about the changes that happened on July 1st across the country. And most of your states had new laws enacted. And then it trickled down to your local communities. And yet most people don't even know if they missed an article in a newspaper. They don't know what laws were changed. This is occurring not necessarily by law, but by evolution in the spiritual realm. And why we have to keep up in the time of Michael to connect to the spiritual world and to see is so that we can keep up with the evolution that's occurring naturally to humanity as opposing forces seek to instill more fake science, witchcraft, witch doctor stuff, um, 
lobotomies were legal and shock treatment not too long ago. And, and so that's intensifying. And yet there's, there's a, uh, inability for men to say, well, where's the, where is the leader of the spiritual world? Where is the, the churches aren't here. The Pope those is going a different direction. How do we know it's, it's going to be up to your personal relationship with God every day in your own inner conscience is how this rolls. And that's not a, if that's not an easy thing to, to, to understand when you would like to plug it into, I don't know, your, your home budget or your business world. It's not, something that you plug in it's something you live and it's up to you there's nobody here telling you what to do there's no you can see it in the material world there's no governing authorities anymore that we trust would we would tell us anything yeah there's there's transitions and things don't always just evolve at the same rate there is certain critical points at which things can shift very, very quickly. And so it's important to, to, to keep in mind the indications of Rudolf Steiner that there would be a, a small group of individuals that would be able to accomplish serving that uh, particular grail impulse, just like at the end of Atlantis, there were small groups of people that traveled off and created the civilization centers uh, in Central Asia and, and stopping off and creating mystery centers along the way so that there could be spread these impulses. But the uh, 1899 was the end of Kali Yuga, as Joe just said. And what that is is a 500 year cycle that spans from 5, the time of, pardon me? 5,000? Yeah, 5,000. Uh, it spans from the time of Krishna. And so that it's the Iron Age. It's the really de the descent into that materialism is, is the key uh, theme of that, according to the cycle of the Yugas in the uh, Indian tradition. So that ended in 1899, which is interesting because that was the year that Rudolf Steiner had his first experience of the etheric Christ. And the crux of Rudolf Steiner's Christian path is that Christ incarnated Jesus at the turning point of time, and that he isn't going to come back again as a, as a physical being. He's already here. And it's up to us to be able to develop our capacity to be able to be receptive to what he's attempting to bring to us. And so if somebody shows up and says, hey, I'm him, well, you know they're not them because it already happened and he didn't just come for us. The angels learned from it, the archangels learned from it, the, the whole hierarchy. It was the first time that a being from the higher worlds came down here and took up a human form. And so it was a, a miraculous event for the whole chain of revolution. And so it behooves ourselves to try and at least have some kind of artistic or meditative point at, during the day at some time to be able to center yourself and try to be receptive to those wholesome impulses. Yes, and, he and the descent into hell also, <laughs> uh, something very important. Uh, something that uh, Rudolf Steiner speaks about. Well, the heavens held their breath for three days, waiting to see what was going to happen. Do you remember that? <laughs> that book? Wow. When I read that, it fell down. It said even the heavens and the higher beings all had to wait in anticipation because it's never been accomplished before. And this is what why Christ says, Jesus Christ says on the cross, it is accomplished. It, they knew they were trying to do. Think about this, <laughs> but it hadn't been done. And this is you know, talking about drama or Hollywood movies. I mean, in reality, it, the, the complexity, the sacredness, the anxiety in heaven, and I think it even says it's spoken in the Bible about there was anxiety in heaven. Anxiety, you know, there wasn't any uh, Xanax up there in heaven. <laughs> there was anxiety of, of what was happening on the earth. 
And so it was accomplished. And so through the descent into hell and then the coming back uh, and here, and John is correct. And it's not said enough. He is here and he is here. And uh, since I believe Steiner speaks about 1909, he really, um, Christ really makes his first appearance um, visibly. And I believe it was 1909 um, in the etheric, in the clouds, for those who don't know what we're speaking about, he will appear again in the clouds. 1933 is a really a key uh, yeah. turning point for the the experience of the etheric Christ. But in in coming to an understanding of, of, of Rudolf Steiner's work is that he did it through the path that he lays out in the philosophy of freedom. It was a path of through pursuing the path of intuition that he developed out of his Curtian studies, which is a, a path of thinking, thinking about thinking, because thinking is a spiritual process. It's not a brain process. The brain is, that's like blaming your, your glasses for the, <laughs> the beautiful sunset you're, you're looking at, you know? <laughs> it's like, blaming your no, glasses for the it's horrible not in, It's not inside your glasses. Yeah. <laughs> But uh, it's a beautiful thing. And so if we can try and, and just leave the, the story open, that if you can live it with that spirit of the quest, that's what the grail path is. It's, it's to live within the question. Because if you can leave that as an open question, uh, you can get more uh, in, in the development of your understanding and and. If Rita Stein says if one thinks back over things one accomplished in one's life, and, and of course I'm paraphrasing, but he says, you know, you might write something down and, and then go back and look at it, you know, 50 years later and find things in your own creativity that you didn't even know was yeah. there at the yeah. time. Well, that, that thing that you were speaking about with uh, the grail and the quest. I was talking to some friends in Manhattan yesterday. Um, I had a meeting with some good friends. We drove down, and quickly we were speaking about a casino when we were younger, gambling in Atlantic City. And if you can get out of Atlantic City and not lose your money after you win some money, nobody can. It's a big temptation not to be able to walk out of a casino. Very hard. And uh, I won't go into more of the story, except it's very difficult. And the quest is like that, if, if it could be, where – as I said earlier, when I'm younger, reading my first book or second book, it, I knew and it's very difficult, but I felt it. I don't know why I felt it, but that I could endure. Endure was a key word, almost like a quest, that suffering and pain of unknown, not knowable yet. And I'd have to wait maybe 50 years of forever when i didn't realize it's forever that there's so much that it's a living thing but to endure enough to catch enough so you're you're at least in the lifeboat you're inside you're not in the water you know drowning you're in the lifeboat you're you're, you're rowing but you're safe until you get to this point where there's enough of a cosmology being built little by little piece by piece to give you more sense of inner security and patience to stay in the quest for no reward. <laughs> That's the other thing. <laughs> There's no seeking. If I do this, I'll win a million dollars or I'll build my company. This is something that you're looking to become conscious and participate with total reality. And you don't know, and you might as well be blind in the blind world. But that is almost like the opposite of the casino temptation <laughs> where you're being pulled to stay there. In this one case, you're trying to, Pull, hold yourself into this no man's land of information as Rudolf Steiner. And you know, you have to listen, you know, he's almost like a knight on a, on a horse and you're, you're walking behind him in, in the uh, Sherwood forest and you've got to follow. You just have to, and you can't see his face. He's an armor, blue male, and you just have to very, it's not hard. It's bizarre. That feeling of the quest, um, because there is no reward that you can quantify according to the earth world. Well, again, going back to the quotation that I shared last week, and I think it has even more relevance today now that we've unfolded some of this story. 
as you unpack it, you start to find that there's so many dimensions to it. But in the lecture of Sacramentalism, Daedalus and Icarus from July 8, 1904 in Berlin, he says, the essence of sacramentalism is that the human being fills everyday things with the sacred spiritual quality. The sense and point of the ancient legends was to bring about the right vibration in people's souls so that they were filled with spiritual strength. Through this, the simplest action of a naive heart can be hallowed. We can try as hard as we like to bring harmony and order to the physical plane, but it will fail as long as we work only on the physical plane. Harmony created on the one side gives rise to disharmony on the other. But if you let the spiritual operate, you will see that everyday matters are approached in a completely different way. This is sacramentalism. That's so true. That is so true. And I've, I have some personal things of, that happened and, and recently and went, wow. And you, and you have to have that, I don't even want to call it faith, that certainty. And if you have enough of these experiences, as many people in ordinary life do, you build your confidence up. And confidence comes from knowing what comes next. And that's what Anthroposophy and Rudolf Steiner have brought us, knowing what came before and knowing what comes next and knowing what where we want to position ourselves, our life, our love, our work, our treasure, in that quest of what's next. But it all comes from places that John and Doug speak about in the uh, Stone Age <laughs> to uh, Kali, the end of Kali Yuga in 1899, to future ep yugas, future uh, epics, future planetary existence. And because we know the past through Rudolf Steiner and, and through the Roscrucians and the mysteries, it gives us certainty. And we also can correctly place science in its infancy um, and it's, and it's with its mistakes and errors uh, in, in the right place within this uh, quest because science will be spiritualized and it, it, it won't be long. It, it's, it's on its way now. It's falling apart with its theories and, uh, and it will be renewed. Yes. And so we're starting to get to the end of our wonderful little conversation here. But I want to remind people, I, I, I've written The Arcana of the Grail Angels, Spiritual Science of the Holy Blood and of the Holy Grail, a study developed out of the work of Rudolf Steiner of the underground streams of esoteric Christianity, which flowed from the Brotherhood of the Holy Grail to the Order of Knights Templar and the True Rosicrucian Order, as put forward by Douglas Gabriel. And the sequel that's still available, that the, the first volume I just showed you, sorry, is still out of print, but uh, the Arcana of Light on the Path is available and it has a forward by the noted astrosopher and psychologist William Bento and has my cosmological drawings that are derived primarily from Ernst Pfeiffer, student of Rudolf Steiner, the cosmological diagrams. And, uh, but I've been doing a series with Douglas, uh, the interviews of the exorcist, and I just did uh, uh, several, I like four of them. And, uh, but I put a link below if you wanna check those out. I have them in a folder on my, uh, my YouTube channel. And so, and, and there's a folder for all the ones here with Joe and things that Joe, Douglas and I have done together and all these other fun, uh, explorations in consciousness, I guess we could call them, because that's essentially what we're doing here. And I want to thank everybody for for coming here. And of course, uh, special thanks go out to Tyler and Douglas Gabriel and Vadim and Vivian and Joe here, and Jenna and Neil and Lee and Tim and Christian and Laura and Paula and on a mirror, there's all these wonderful people, uh, Ray and Whitney and James and Marilyn. I want to thank you all for being so supportive over the years and in this discreet 
one of the smallest channels on YouTube. <laughs> and, uh, that's okay. I only want people here that can sincerely attempt to try to figure out what we're talking about. So that narrows it down quite a bit. And that's okay. All the other people can uh, do whatever they like. But Joe, I want to thank you so much. Thanks for uh, having me again. Uh, also, uh, if you want to contribute to my endeavor, that's paypal.me forward slash John Barnwell 888, just like it says here on the screen. John Barnwell 888. And thank you, everyone. And uh, we go into the uh, have a wonder af wonderful afternoon.